Well, hi everybody. Uh, it's just Rusty again, and this is kind of the final in my my series on my trail routine. And today I'm going to be talking about hostels and, and resupply. So there's a lot of topics to go over. First, resupply opportunities. You know, the basic uh, topic. And then I'll talk about stretching your supplies because that's kind of related to uh, resupplying. The more you can stretch your supplies, that's kind of mini resupplies along the way, uh, if I can call it that. I'll talk about hostels and hotels, not too much about hotels, but hostels. Um, then I'll talk about park campgrounds, either national park campgrounds or state park campgrounds. Those are great opportunities along the way. And we'll talk about laundering and showering. And then I'm going to get a little off topic and get a little nostalgic. And I'm going to talk about a lot of the great people that I've actually met while on the trail. I mean, you know, if you think of the trail as just going out walking in the woods in isolation, um, you're missing a, a, a big part of the experience. So with resupply, number one rule is know your resupply opportunities. In the case of the Mid-Atlantic States, when I was going from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania down to Roanoke, this really meant knowing when my next resupply opportunity was. Um, you'll find that hiking in Maine, for example, is very different than the Mid-Atlantic States. In Maine, resupply opportunities just aren't quite as common or easy to come by um, as they are, uh, you know, down, down south. Um, when I was down south, all I had to do was kind of know where the next one was. Um, when I was in Maine, it's, you do have to know where the next one is, but it's going to most likely be a lot farther away than would be typical on other parts of the trail. Always plan to resupply, you know, have one more day worth of resupply than you think it's going to take to get to the next resupply point, you know, before your food or your fuel runs out. Water is a whole different story. As you know, you, you really do have to resupply water along the way, just, you know, streams and filtering, that sort of thing. Another thing that uh, to be aware of, and this is something people used to do in the old days, the old days, you know, when, when through hiking was a relatively new phenomenon back in the, you know, 70s, um, they would mail things to themselves, to general delivery at post offices along the way. And um, there's nothing more frustrating, I suppose, than having something delivered to a post office that you expected to get there on a Friday and you were a little late getting into town and it was Friday afternoon after closing, you know, Friday evening before you got to the post office and they weren't available. And if it's a small town, they might not be open on Saturday. So you have to wait until Monday to get your supplies. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, you could end up losing the whole weekend because you couldn't get your supplies. Uh, another thing to be aware of is if you do send something to a post office, you must address it to the hiker legal name that's on an ID because you have to present an ID uh, once you get there. Um, we're going to be, um, you know, it's going to have on it your approximately uh, arrival date, but say hold for Appalachian Trail through hiker on or around whatever date you expect to be there. Um, I heard of one case where somebody had sent something and it actually got returned to them saying, no, you can't do it this way. You actually have to say that it's an Appalachian Trail through hiker. I mean, the post office knew what this was, but they felt it was necessary to return it and make them do it correctly. And the person missed their delivery. Now, uh, Katrina actually sent something to me and she sent it to me at a, to a, um, a hostel that I expected to be at on a certain date. And I actually was there on a certain date. Uh, unfortunately, it was during that time when uh, the, uh, the postal service had been intentionally slowed down in order to, you know, mess with the uh, absentee ballots and stuff like that. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't receive it. I actually had to leave like a day. I hung around as much as I could, but I had no idea when it was going to arrive. So I left on a, uh, I think it was a Monday morning. And sure enough, it did arrive Monday afternoon. Now that, that hostel, they were quite accustomed to this and they bounced it forward and they knew exactly how to address it. And they sent it to me. Um, they were in Duncan, Pennsylvania, and it got sent to me uh, in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, and I arrived there, um, took a hotel room just by plan, and I got to the post office the next morning. It was a weekday, and they were open, and they had it for me, and, and I received it. So that worked out. So it can work out. Just be aware if you're doing a resupply of that sort using post offices, better off actually using a hostel. 
uh, just make sure you send it in plenty of time. And most hostels, if you're going to stay at the hostel, they will also have a, you know, a free service that they will accept your delivery so that you can pick them up. So that's another alternative to the on the fly uh, resupply that you might want to do. But it does commit you to either paying a fee if you're not staying at the hostel or to stay at that hostel. And they, they understand they will hold it for you, you know, sufficient amount of time. Um, stretching supplies, number one rule is anytime you can pick up a meal, go for it. Um, there are a lot of times roadside food trucks. Here's two here. Um, the one on the right was one that Mike and I came across in New York. Uh, it was a nice little hot dog stand, uh, just a small businessman just trying to make a living. Um, there happened to be a nice um, ice cream shop just over the hill from there, so we got dessert there. Um, this other one was on Route 22. It was a real high-end, just fantastic uh, hamburgs, the best I've ever had. Um, they actually tantalized us with a uh, advertisement a day away you know there was like a sign along a, uh, a roadside saying in one day you're going to be at this uh, food truck and we have homemade raspberry lemonade and I looked forward to that homemade ra raspberry lemonade that whole day and, and into the next and fortunately we got there during regular business hours and in fact we had to wait because the guy had to go out and drive to the butcher I mean that's how good the meat was he was going to the butcher to get the hamburger meat and we had to wait for that and it just made it taste better um, another thing is, of course, uh, diners or markets close to the trail. There's a lot of them, and there will usually be a sign near the trail. And if you've got Gut Hook or uh, Far Out, as it's called now, or one of the other hiker data services, you'll know where they are. Um, if you have an opportunity, uh, now with the, the cooties going around, they probably don't have open salad bars anymore, but they may have some pre-made uh, pre ones. Um, and, you know, it's like cameling up. You come across a water supply get as much into your body so you don't have to carry it on your back as you can uh, same thing here eat eat your meal and then still fill up your pack so that you'll actually be able to make things last longer and i've also found that if i'm doing just trail food i run out of energy pretty quick it's it's hard to carry enough calories with you but if you take these opportunities it's uh it'll help you help your hiking uh, quite a bit um trail magic always take advantage of it but be courteous um, these gentlemen on the right, uh, they had burgers and hot dogs. That's what I call the active trail magic. These were experienced hikers themselves. Um, and they just love to, you know, to, to help out uh, fellow hikers. Um, you know, you do have to stay and be polite and talk and converse and, you know, be grateful. But uh, it, was, it was very nice. And as a matter of fact, one of these uh, guys, uh, actually two of them were the trail angels. Another one was just another hiker. Uh, one of them suggested I take an alternate route going up to the top of the hill I was going to. Um, and I didn't want to seem rude and say, oh, yeah, 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 and then go up the trail. I mean, he said there was really nothing to see on that part of the trail, and it was going to start to rain. I'd be better off just taking this particular road that paralleled the trail. And I did, and Craig called me out on it because he was watching <laughs> my uh, tracker say where I was going. But um, this, other, this other one, uh, this bin, you can see a little tub there. That is actual supplies I found at a... Uh, at a shelter, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Um, it was actually not food, but it was other sorts of supplies. Um, I picked up a pair of tweezers out of it that I that I needed in case I got any ticks. Um, there are a few other supplies. There was ibuprofen. I didn't happen to need any at the time, but there were some other hikers there who were very excited. Oh my God, vitamin I, you know, and they, they went for it. Um, I, and there was a, a nice little note on it from the person saying, hey, I can't hike. I think it was, uh, they indicated it may have been uh, health reasons they couldn't hike, uh, but they hoped to get better and get out there and hiking and hope that we could, uh, you know, use some of these things that they had left. And it was just, it was just really nice. Um, and it was a, just another way to, to stretch the supplies because if you can stretch the supplies and that's much, that much farther you can go on the trail before you hit a resupply. Um, hostels and hotels. Don't be ashamed to take a break. I know a lot of people go out there and they have this idea that you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to rough it. I'm going to be out on the trail every night in my tent. I never even use a shelter. And I hear from hikers once they're up way up north saying, hey, you started out, you were always a tent guy, and now you're taking shelters. Um, you'll go crazy doing that. Yeah, you're out there in the majority of your nights. When I was out there, 80% of my nights were either in a shelter or in my tent, a little bit more in my tent than the shelter. But, you know, nothing wrong with stopping by a hostel, um, getting a shower, 
Uh, most hostels have a resupply run either to the local Dollar General or Walmart or something like that, or they're physically located close enough that you can just walk there. Um, and they will have showers and almost always have a laundry opportunity. Um, there was one minor exception where they didn't have actually have it on the premises. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, so here's some examples of some of the hostels I stayed at uh, down south. I don't have pictures of ones from prior trips, but I'll mention them. Um, this first one, this is uh, the Rock and Soul. It's just south of Port Clinton. I was headed south, so I only know that it was south of Port Clinton. Um, uh, the Rock and Soul, that's uh, Jody and Craig. Uh, Craig was the, and the dog's name is Sugar, by the way. Um, Craig was an experienced hiker. I don't know if Jody hiked or not, but he built a beautiful, beautiful hostel, nice, clean, uh, right in what looked to me like maybe a utility garage or something. Um, and the deal was, you know, he picked you up knowing you were going to stink. He had, a, he had like a, a nice car and a, a cruddy one and you got picked up in the junk one and you were brought down there and basically you went into the shower and he took your clothes and he laundered them for you. And when you're done with your shower and wearing, you know, some of the loner clothes, most hostels have loner clothes for you to use when your dirty clothes are being de-stinkified. Um, and when you got out of the shower, uh, you know, a little while later after you got dressed and you're kind of settling in the, the hostel, he comes by with nice folded uh, laundry. Um, this next one was in Duncannon. That's kind of outdoorsy is the name of it. That's more of a commercial one. It is a good hostel. Um, they uh, have an attached resupply, whereas Craig actually drove you to the Dollar General and to the local deli for something to eat uh, at the uh, kind of outdoorsy they actually it was a commercial establishment with a resupply uh, on it and uh, they didn't happen to have a laundry but two doors down that you could just walk to in in 30 seconds there was a commercial laundry called the hikers laundry or something like that so there there was that that laundering opportunity um, I did had a, an interesting discussion with a, a, another hiker there because I mentioned the rock and soul as being a great place and you know, when he found out it was $50 a night, uh, which is what the cost was then, don't know what it is now. But he's like, oh, that's way too expensive. And I'm thinking, well, where we're staying at 25 Yeah, much more reasonable. And then you spent $5 to go get your laundry. And then you spent probably $15 on breakfast at one of the local restaurants. Jody cooks your breakfast for you, whatever you want, and serves it on their front porch. You know, nice coffee out and everything. It's just a, a beautiful experience. And cost is really the same. He's not getting rich on this. He's trying to help out hikers. So I, I think this is a, a great thing. This next one was the Stumble Inn. That is near Front Royal, Virginia. Um, I apologize to them. I don't remember the names of the two hikers, but they were actually uh, 2018 through hikers, uh, a, a younger couple. Um, They've just got a really nice place there, laundry right there. Um, you know, a lot of them have stocked refrigerators, honor system, throw a buck in if you're going to eat this or that. Um, and they bring you over to a, uh, a supermarket in Port Royal uh, in order to, to resupply. Uh, the next one I'm showing here is um, Stanimals. Uh, Stanimal, obviously that's a trail name. Uh, he has two. This is the one in Glasgow. It's just a house. You know, but it's uh, got bunks built into it. Um, the caretaker there uh, was a very, made great breakfast for you. Um, that, you know, just uh, I forget whether it was an extra charge for the breakfast or not. Um, it, it, they were high carb breakfast. You know, in my civilian life, I don't eat that way. But, you know, give me the calories. I'm going to I'm going to pack them in so that I can hike well. Um, a few other uh Notable hostels, and I apologize to any hostel owner that I don't mention, uh, but some of the others that I've come across in my travels, uh, one of my favorites is the Hiker's Welcome run by Pack Rat, obviously a, another hiker, uh, up in, I think it's in Glencliff, uh, New Hampshire. It's just as you're getting into the White Mountains, um, just a, a fantastic place. Um, there's the Rattle River, I think it's the Rattle River Inn, which is on the other side of the Presidential Range. So where's the Hiker's Welcome is if you're going north, entering the White Mountains. Uh, Rattle River is, you're not out of the White Mountains, but you're beyond the Presidential Range at least. Another great place. I mean, you show up, you're expected, hit the shower, put your clothes in a laundry bag, we'll launder it for you, and um, then worry about checking in, you know, signing in. 
Uh, most of the hostels uh, don't require anything more than maybe a day ahead, call ahead, and nowadays with cell phones and everything, we're, we're able to do that, uh, even text sometimes. Uh, in Andover, Maine, Pine Ellis was great service to us. Uh, when I first went up to Maine, uh, Mike uh, had suggested that I go to Pine Ellis, and it turned out about to be really good because uh, that was when uh, my son got sick, uh, Craig got sick while we were out hiking, and, and we had to uh, bail out of that trip. That sort of thing happens, and you have to be prepared for it. And they provided the services. I mean, it was uh it, it, it gave Darlene peace of mind knowing that we were being taken care of and that they picked us up at uh, actually a ski resort off trail that we managed to find our way to and and got us back to civilization and uh, you know happy to say that, that Craig was much better it was just one of those uh, you know short-term things um, and Monson Maine is Shaw's uh, very well known it's changed hand a few times I don't know who owns it now but um, there's Shaw's there. There's also another one which I have not stayed at, but I probably will be using for my uh, my northward uh, trip uh, in 2022. It's up in Millinocket. I don't know the name of it, but uh, uh, from what I understand, there's a good one there. Okay, another thing that you may come across is government-run and state national parks. Um, they can range in price from very inexpensive to very expensive. Um, the uh, more, exp more expensive ones, actually, I'm not sure if it's actually a government-run one or it's a non-government organization that runs the hut system in the White Mountains. Uh, but they offer a great kind of on-trail break. When I was down in the Shenandoah uh, National Park, I used two of the kind of like they were drive-up campgrounds, but a hiker could just walk in and first come, first serve. But when I was down there, there was plenty of room. Um, and I ended up uh, twice staying there, uh, very cheap. I mean, it was $15 a campsite, but the first one I went to, which was, uh, geez, I gotta look at the name here. Excuse me while I squint at my screen. Um, it was Lewis Mountain, I believe. Uh, Lewis Mountain um, Campground. And that's where I met uh, uh, a hiker going north and we kind of looked at each other and could tell that we were both long distance hiking and trying to figure out what the situation was and we decided we were just going to split a campground there so that was 750 each and then uh, another friend showed up and I saw him he was looking around didn't even see me and I waved to him and he was like oh wow you know Russ good to see you and um or bad news he would have known me as and uh, he joined us so it was like five dollars each I think we broke the rules you're only supposed to have two tents but we had three it cost us five dollars each and uh, the nice thing about those uh, campgrounds and even state park ones usually they have at least a shower and sometimes a laundry the ones in the Shenandoah National Park did have um, the laundry for us so here's some examples uh, this first picture here that is actually I believe that's the Elk Wallow Wayside it's not actually a campground per se but it is a good resupply uh, point and it's right where you're crossing uh, the parkway you know in the Shenandoah National Park so it's it's right off trail and it's a great place to stretch your supplies by, you know, going for the meal, buying the meal, and um, then uh, act actual resupply. And it's one of the bigger ones so that you can actually get like, you know, the mountain house meals if that's your thing, you know, and that sort of thing. And I was able to pick up actually a, a, a aftermarket uh, boot laces because I had a boot lace failure. So I was able to do that there. This next picture is from the, I think that's the Lewis Mountain uh, the store there, there was a coin operated shower in there, there's a coin operated laundry in there, very small because that happens to be the smallest of the campgrounds in the in that national park. Uh, but they were just fantastic ways to kind of kind of still be out in the trail, sleeping in your tent, but still, you know, enjoying some of the comforts of civilization, getting, you know, some uh, a little bit of food there and uh, being able to do a resupply. Um, and, and that's how I found uh, going south to resupply was a much easier thing than, than I expected it to be. Uh, these next ones, this next picture, I believe that's the Mitzpah Hut in the White Mountains. Now the hut system there is kind of expensive um, and you have to make reservations ahead of time. So if you're doing long distance hiking, it's very hard to use them as a regular guest. It is, I, I almost wanted to call it touristy 
but it's really not that touristy because these huts are not easy to get to. They have no electricity. They do have gas for uh, cooking. There are no showers there. Uh, you can get water, plenty of water, and there's usually a small resupply store, kind of expensive. Um, but if you do make a reservation, you do get, you know, a bunk. It's, uh, some of them have semi-private, you know, like maybe four bunks to a room. Um, and you get a, a dinner. It's the earthy, crunchy stuff, you know, rocks, grass, dirt, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, they're nice meals. And then a, a good breakfast. So um, this next picture is actually the, I'm sure that's the Lonesome Lake hut. Um, that's where Craig and I first met um, Logan, who I will mention early, uh, later in this talk. And in that case, it was, uh, you know, we stayed at four of the huts and it was over $100 each per night. Uh, so we did, the two of us, I did spend over $800. Um, so it is an expensive option if, uh, you know, if that's the kind of, you don't have the kind of money and I completely understand. I had to, you know, if you know me, you know that, you know, George Washington blinks his eyes when I pull a dollar bill out of my wallet. Um, I had to think long and hard, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, if you're through hiking, a lot of times they will have, you know, work for stay opportunities where you help them clean up in the, uh, in the kitchen or sweep up or something. And, you know, there's usually leftovers and you can get a decent meal and throw down your uh, sleeping pad and sleeping bag and you get to sleep in the kitchen, you know, after hours, uh, in the, in the dining area, I should say. Um, so those are opportunities, um, for through hikers. Laundries and showers, well, <laughs> take every shower you can. Um, a lot of hikers told me that I must have set a personal, you know, it's some kind of a record uh, amongst through hikers because in uh, 566 miles, 41 days on the trail, I actually took like 11 showers. That's like every fourth day I had a shower. May sound gross to you because you're. it's worse than civilian life because you're stinky because you've been sweating, but the opportunities just aren't there and you, it's part of life on the trail. Um, but I did, I did get these showers. Um, you can get them at hostels and hotels, obviously, but you can also get them at the government in a non-government organization run um, uh, campgrounds and stuff. Uh, well, one of the things I did mention about the, uh, the hut system, no showers there, but once you get into the valleys in the White Mountains and you stop at one of the lodges, you can get a shower and you can get, you know, a, a pretty decent room if, if that's what you want, like at the Highland Center or the Joe Dodge Lodge, um, that sort of place. Um, here... Um, is actually the shower at the Rock and Soul again. Um, just, it's an outdoor shower, but you know, it's covered in everything and there's a door on it. So it's not like you're exposed to the public, but you know, it's a, a very nice facility. And, uh, like I said, you know, there's loner clothes there. Uh, your clothes get washed. Um, and, uh, you know, don't leave electronics in your pockets. I, I didn't, but I accidentally did leave a little baggie with some Dramamine in it and, when it came out of the wash, it was all liquid. Fortunately, the bag didn't open, but it was permeable enough that, you know, threw the stuff away, but it was extra anyway. Um, this next picture is actually not the shower, solar showers. I want to talk about solar showers. Solar showers are, are hit or miss. I took this picture while I was standing next to the solar shower. I wish I'd taken a picture of the shower itself, but it was a nice one. And as you can see, I'm out in an open field and I arrived here like kind of mid afternoon. So the solar shower is just a shower with a, some kind of black container on top that absorbs the heat of the sun. And if it's a sunny day, you can get actually a decent shower out of it. And I did. It wasn't the warmest shower I've ever had, but it was a good one. Uh, I came across some other solar showers that I didn't even bother. I mean, they were overgrown trees all over them. It's like, you, you're just going to, you may as well just take water straight out of the cold stream and dump it over your head uh, for, for all that's going to do, do for you. So... Um, so that's showers, laundries, like I said, um, at the, uh, at the campgrounds in the, uh, Shenandoah National Park, for example, I stayed at two of them, Lewis Mountain, I forget the name of the other one, but, uh, they both had, you know, nice laundries. Um, one of them, the, the one that wasn't Mount Lewis, uh, was, or Lewis Mountain was actually, um, a larger one and it was a, it was a really good shower and they even had a change machine built into the wall. So, you know, you throw in a $5 bill, you get all your quarters, you can take your shower, you can take your laundry, uh, recharge things because there's always electricity at these places. So that's, um, always a, always a good deal. Okay. So now I'm going to get a little off topic and I'm going to talk about 
meeting people. It, you know, I'm actually, believe it or not, kind of shy around new people. Um, uh, even people I, I sort of know when they say hi, you know, if I've got a mask on at work, I kind of grunt a hello at them and I realize they probably think I'm being rude and I, I, I've got to work on my people skills because I, I just don't really have them. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll get these people right and their pictures will come up in the right order. But here's just some of the people I've met uh, out on the trail and uh, you know, like I said, just some of them, but just a story with each one of them. Here's Logan. Uh, Crusher is his uh, trail name. Uh, Craig and I met him. You saw his picture earlier. We met him out uh, at one of the, the huts. Uh, he ended up getting caught in a thunder and lightning storm. We got caught we were like a half hour ahead of him. We got caught in a hailstorm on top of uh, Mount Lafayette. Um, then he came in like a drowned rat a little later. It was thunder and lightning up there. And if you know Mount Lafayette, that is a, un, there, there's no shelter up there. There's nothing. I mean, it's like you're out above tree line. There's lightning bolts going all over the place. He was lucky to get down there alive. And we decided to hike with him for the rest of that trip. So we, I don't remember how many days it was. And a couple years later, I called him up and I, or I, I contacted him somehow, and I, I said, "Hey, you want to hike in, uh, you know, over the presidential range?" And um, uh, actually, this was beyond the presidential range, and he was actually the guy who advised me. That was when I had the burns on my legs. He says, "You know, you can't keep doing this. You got you got to stop." And and he had a, a knee injury anyway, so he he was, uh, you know, motivated to stop. So just a great guy. I haven't talked to him in a while uh, lost track of him a little bit but he's you know from Pennsylvania and was a great person to, to meet Buckwild and B just a couple hikers I met didn't know them very well Buckwild the older gentleman was uh, he was a kilt wearer uh, that was one of the few kilt wearers I've seen out there you know bless his heart he came like at that point 1700 miles wearing a kilt these two guys I'm sure they just met out there and they were you know friends at that point um, Paco and Aimless were just some day hikers I ran into right after I'd almost stepped on a uh, copperhead as a matter of fact and I had a nice nice conversation with them just just nice people you know I, I I'll never see them again um, I just saw them for that few minutes but you know that's them um, Bob uh, Weidman I think is his name uh, I introduced you to him before he kind of inspired me to do this series because uh, you know a lot of people ask me about the equipment and everything um, he was out on the trail writing a sermon. I guess he's a, from what I can tell, he's a, a minister. And, uh, you know, going out into nature to, to, to think of, you know, for your sermon. I think that was a, a, a great thing. Uh, Peter, or Nacho, uh, you know, he was headed north. I was headed south. We happened to run into each other at the Dahlgren Backpackers Camp. He gave me some coffee, you know, great in the morning. Um, and you might think, well, okay, he's headed north, I'm headed south, we'll never come in contact again. But, you know, we were texting back and forth, we exchanged contact information, and he was in Massachusetts, and he was going to be in Great Barrington, and he was asking me how he could get up to Pittsfield, and take a train to Northampton, and then down to, uh, you know, Springfield, and, and then get down to the airport. It's like, no, I'm going to pick you up, and I'm going to bring you to the airport. It's going to save you a day. You're not going to go around Robin Hood's barn to do it. So, you know, and that's the sort of thing that, that there is a hiking subculture out there where we like and really enjoy helping each other. So I was more than glad to do that. Um, Linda was a trail angel who saw me. I don't even know if she thinks of herself as a trail angel. She was actually a businesswoman, some kind of holistic uh, health uh, business she has. And um, I was uh, hiking down a road, a very busy road. I couldn't hitchhike. It was just to be too dangerous. And she came up the other way. She saw me. She turned around, picked me up brought me to the Walmart, kept my stuff in her car while I did a resupply run at the Walmart, and then she brought me back up to the trailhead, and she must have saved me six hours. I mean, I got through Maryland a day earlier than I expected uh, because of her efforts, and uh, it was just it was just a beautiful thing. It, it, she just did it because she wants to help out another human being, and that's the type of people you run, out, uh, run into out there. I mean, yeah, there are some jerks, you know, but uh, the jerks are far outnumbered. And, and, like, and even though I'm going to show you 15 people here, 15 groups of people, uh, there are a lot more who I could show you who are really great people. Um, Dynamite and Crazy Legs, uh, this is a little out of order. I actually met them after I met Brian, who's up next. Um, you know, one night in a shelter, yet we are exchanging uh, texts. And when he asked me, you know, what can I do in, in Maine? I, you know, gave him some advice on that. And it's just, and, you know, I feel like we're friends, even though we've actually only met once. 
Brian I ran into at the uh, in the Shenandoah National Park uh, you know saw him at a campground said, hey, he seems like a real nice guy and uh, you know uh, he's the one who uh, I ran into later at the Lewis Mountain campground and he shared the campsite with us and we just started hiking together he was doing 100 miles and uh, you know he was doing the length of the Shenandoah National Park um, he fed me the largest pizza I've ever seen in my life I mean we shared it um, you know, we took a hotel room uh, that night because he was getting off trail and needed to get an Uber ride to a train. Uh, I had my uh, high school track coach picking me up uh, to visit him in Charlottesville. So that's how Brian and I met, and uh, we keep in contact and bless him. He's been married. He was recently married, and uh, they're expecting their first child. So we're hoping that uh, he and his wife have a healthy and, and happy child. Matrix was the other hiker who uh, was me and Brian with me and Brian at the uh, the Lewis Mountain Campground. We uh, I saw him and like, hey man, you know, like you through hiking, you going on, or you you staying here? And that's when he didn't even realize you could stay there. And you know, we were trying to figure it out together, and we rented the campground. Um, I actually asked him, hey, you know, you want, next year you want to hike together? And he said, yeah, he might. Um, I told him, hey, I understand if you decide you want to, you know, go alone. You know, if I contact you and you say, no, I'm not interested. He said, no, it wouldn't be because I didn't want to go alone. And I've actually found out, I think from Brian, that uh, Matrix has got some kind of property in West Virginia. Uh, you know, it sounds like a farm of some kind. I don't know the exact details, but, you know, he might be unavailable because he's uh, doing that. And that, I think that's just a fantastic thing. Um, here's some just hikers and their dogs. You know, they allowed me to take their picture and we talked for a short while. This next one. Uh, was at the Elk Wallow Wayside. I had gotten a hamburger at the grill, and uh, this uh, proud grandpa with his uh, grandson. I apologize to the little boy um, just for security and safety reasons. I've had to blur out his face, you know, cover it. Uh, it's unfortunate the world is like that today, um, but this was this, this is for his safety. But uh, grandpa never really got his name, but he was, I believe, an Air Force veteran, and he worked for the government. And just listening to this man just talk about his life experience. He was in his 80s, you know, his daily routine. It was just a, it was a fantastic thing. And I, I really enjoyed it. I wish I could have maybe even filmed him, but that might have made him feel self-conscious. Um, just a wonderful gentleman. I'm um, out spoiling his grandson. And uh, he wasn't hiking. They were just driving through and stopped at the wayside. And just, uh, you know, another, uh, just another fantastic experience to see, you know, other people, loving America and uh, and sharing their experiences. And that was really great. Um, this German couple, uh, Mike and I, met uh, when we were hiking in New York, you know, just for a few minutes, you know, talked a little bit. It was just nice to meet somebody from another country, you know, willing to speak English, able to speak English, because I speak no German. Um, and, uh, you know, we just had a nice little sit down meal with them, uh, well, out on the picnic table outside the deli that you can see in the background here. Bill Ackerley um, had a house right on the trail, and if you stop by, he'd give you an ice cream. He had to sign his books. He had some great uh, reference material uh, for anybody needing to study. Okay, sorry about the little interruption there. Uh, my uh, file size uh, got exceeded. So anyways, I was talking about Bill Ackerley, and um, uh, unfortunately, I did learn the next year when I came by, we had reason to be driving by there. Uh, Hiker's Welcome uh, caretaker was giving us a ride. Um, that was uh, a, a trip where uh, Craig had gashed his head and I spit on it and put some dirt on it and rubbed, you know, stuff in it and it just wasn't healing. So we actually had to go back to Bill's place to call. Well, the next year when we went by, we found that Bill had passed away uh, by then. Um, this next one is Packrat. I don't know if that's one word or two, but he's the gentleman who, who runs the uh, Hikers Welcome. And then finally, uh, last person that I happened to be able to get a picture of is Lion King. Um, Lion King was a man with, with big dreams. He was uh, the first and I think maybe possibly still the only person who was ever on a continuous hike uh, done both the upper and northern branches of the uh, American Discovery Trail that goes from the Pacific Coast to the Atlantic Coast and in the middle of the country it splits into two and he managed to hike the northern branch and I guess he got a ride back and then he hiked the southern branch and he went on. The only person known to have do that, I know he had dream, he was uh, trying to do some screenwriting 
and uh, sad to hear that he also passed away, I think, in 2020. Uh, it was not COVID-related. Uh, I think he passed away from cancer. Um, just another wonderful soul that I ran into out there. So for my final uh, story here, I'm going to tell you about the best uh, trail magic that, that I ever got. Um, Craig and I were in the Green Mountains. We were hiking uh, north of, uh, I think we were south of Bennington, actually, at that point. Uh, yeah, we were south of Bennington and in the Green Mountains, and we stopped at the Congdon Camp. It used to be the Congdon Lodge when I was there back in the 70s. Uh, now it's just a shelter. Uh, we were there with Rosemary, and you can see Rosemary and one of the other hikers uh, trying to get to know each other. Rosemary is a very shy dog. Um, stories there about why we stopped bringing her hiking. She just didn't enjoy it. Um, so this hiker came down, you know, we, we were headed north and he came down from the north. He was southbound and he, he said, hey, have you seen uh, so-and-so? And I forget the trail name. We said, no, we, I haven't seen anybody. He says, oh, he's got my steak. And I'm like, I forgot steak. What do you, steak? What are you doing with a steak in him? You're, you're out hiking. Well, the other hiker did show up and, and what had happened was there were three hikers in Bennington in a townie, uh, not meaning that disrespectfully, but a, a, a townie came by and said, hey, you want to ride up to the trailhead? And Bennington is like, I think maybe five miles or so from the trail. So yeah, you'll take a ride if you can get it. And they said, sure. So they hop in the, the truck I, and the guy said, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to just stop at the market here. If that's okay. And they're thinking, well, you're still saving us time. So sure. Guy goes in, buys them each, each of these three guys, 16 ounce steak, corn on the cob, summer squash, just loads them up and says, hey, enjoy this out on the trail. I'm sure the guy was probably a hiker himself. Uh, so um, they get dropped off at the trail and it turns out they weren't actually hiking together. I mean, there were two southbound and one northbound. The northbound was a vegan. So, you know, he was, oh, thank you. You know, and he took the steak and then he gave it to the other two guys. So these guys show up at this camp with 48 ounces, three pounds of thawed out uncooked steak. And there are probably six, seven, eight of us who arrived at that uh, shelter that night. And they cooked up the steaks. Our closing picture is going to be that. Um, I had like a dessert mix, you know, for anybody who wanted raspberry crumble. It was a mountain house mix of some kind. Um, the... Uh, one one young hiker who was actually through hiking the long trail because this was that part of the trail where the Appalachian Trail and the long trail are together you know like sometimes interstate and the state route are together for a while and he had the you know the potato mix as every you know somebody's always got the mashed potato mix and you know between the the fresh vegetables uh steamed corn steak we had a a banquet out in the middle of the green mountains um, thanks to an anonymous trail angel and uh, the combined supplies of the rest of us. So that was like uh, one of the most exciting things because we were otherwise going to have, you know, trail mix and trail bars, uh, you know, for, for supper. I don't know what else we were going to have that night. But, you know, having an unexpected steak dinner in the middle of the Green Mountains is uh, something you'll never forget. So thanks for putting up uh, with me. I know this is a longer, um, you know, one of my longer videos. It is the last one in this series. I know I um and him and haw a lot and have to stare off to my screen to figure out what I'm talking about. I appreciate everybody's uh, attention. And if you've gotten this far, um, you know, this is not a commercial channel, but if you throw a like on the, uh, on the video, you know, I'll know that you're at least watching it. Throw on a comment. I, I answer all comments, but they're usually from people I know anyway. Uh, occasionally they're not. Um, so I, I really appreciate uh, everybody's interest in this series. And um, uh, I guess probably the next thing I'll uh, talk about in a future video may be my plans for 2022. And then I'll probably be out on the trail and start taking a few videos out on the trail. Thanks, everybody.